Hello, everyone from AAPSC 132. Welcome to the second lecture in thermodynamics. The first one was a review of the thermodynamics you studied in APSC 131. Today, we're going to talk about reversible processes. Last year, you talked about irreversible processes, which are real world processes. Reversible processes are more idealized, and we'll talk about them. We're going to be referring to ideal gases, sometimes monoatomic ideal gases. And uh, the discussion will not deal with any chemical changes or physical changes involving bond making or bond breaking as they tend to complicate things. We're going to keep them simple here in the next few lectures. These changes are going to be done under constant temperature. So we call those changes isothermal changes. And uh, we're also going to deal with reversible gases, adiabatic processes, where there is no heat exchanged. So, but that is not going to be in today's lecture. As I mentioned, no bond breaking or bond making is going to happen in these changes that we're talking about. We're talking about a gas system that is going to be compressed or expanded, or we're going to add heat or take heat away from it. That's the simple process we're re referring to here. Now, to give you an explanation for the difference between an irreversible change and a reversible change. In an irreversible change, typically an example would be if I had a gas that was at 100 kilopascals and it expanded against an external pressure of 50 kilopascals. So it would be like the example that we talked about in the first lecture, where you had a confined quantity of gas. It was confined by the placement of a pin and the pressure inside that gas was greater than the external pressure. So of course, when we pull the pin, it immediately expands. So the gas does work on the surroundings as it expands. But if I had to recompress the gas, then when I recompress the gas, I would have to use more work than the work I got out of it. There's wasted energy, simply because the original pressure difference was very was large. Now, let me refer that to a theoretically possible, impossible, reversible change, which is what we're going to calculate. We're going to do it in theory, just like we deal with ideal gas laws. Well, there's no such thing as an ideal gas, but we have to simplify the situation in order to understand it. So for a reversible change, we would take the same gas that's at 100 kilopascals. In that confined system, there's a pin confining it. And we're going to change the external pressure very, very uh, incrementally in small increments. So, so the external pressure would be 99 kilopascals and 98, then 97. So we're going to expand that gas very, very slowly. Okay. So the work is being done on the surroundings as the gas expands. And then when we recompress that particular gas, we're going to do so in really small increments so that the work required is almost equal to the work done on the surroundings. And that's the difference between a reversible and an irreversible change. So we're also going to use boundary work here, where we use graphs to understand what's going on. We're going to use pressure volume work, and we're going to talk about internal combustion engines. So in an internal combustion engine, of course, what you get are explosions as you combust the fuel, the gasoline, which is a hydrocarbon mixture. Um, and that rapid expansion, of course, is brought about by the energy that is released from that combustion. And as the gas expands, it moves a, a shaft, right? A crankshaft. So, so during combustion, like I said, the gas expands, the piston is pushed. The work done on the piston is translated into the rotational motion of that crankshaft. Now, the isothermal reversible processes we're going to talk about, again, what does isothermal mean? It means no temperature change. There's no chemical reactions, no bond breaking, no bond making. 
So the isothermal process is carried out, as we mentioned, constant temperature. And the example I'm going to use is, for instance, let's say you were having a drink on a boat in Lake Ontario, and you decide to throw your ice in the drink overboard and it goes into the water. Well, the lake is so large compared to the ice that you're throwing in there. There's not going to be any change in temperature for that, for the lake, because it's so large. And that's kind of like what we're going to do when we're doing these problems, is we're going to assume that the surroundings are sufficiently large that there's no change in temperature of the surroundings. And keep in mind, the change in internal energy is always equal to NCV delta T. Why CV delta T? Because again, if the gas is at a constant uh, volume, all the energy that goes into that gas is going into the internal energy of the molecules. There's no change in volume. So if there's a change in volume, of course, then you would be at a constant pressure, not a constant volume. So that's delta U. And delta T is gonna be zero because these are isothermal processes. Now, if delta T is equal to zero, and we are using this equation to find delta U, internal energy change, well, delta U is going to be zero. So for any isothermal process, the change in internal energy is zero because there's no change in temperature. Remember, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. If the average kinetic energy of the molecules doesn't change, then there's no change in temperature and vice versa. Now, if we know delta U is equal to Q plus W and delta U is zero for isothermal changes, then Q, heat, and W, work must be equal to each other. They must be equal and opposite. So for any gas that is expanding or contracting, the work and the heat are equal plus opposite. For instance, if a gas, gas expands, it needs heat energy for that expansion to occur. So the heat that flows into the gas must be equal to the work that was done by the gas as it expanded. And of course, when we compress the gas, the opposite is true. The gas, as it's compressed, is going to get hotter. Heat is going to leave the system if we're going to keep the temperature the same. Now, keep in mind, these are all isothermal changes where temperature is not changing. So again, mention that as you compress the gas, releases heat to the surroundings. So the amount of work you did to compress the gas is equal to the amount of heat that came out of the gas as it was compressed. Now consider moving piston again. Here it is. You can see the crankshaft <clears throat> moving, turning the wheels of the car, explosion of the gas. The gasoline is providing the heat energy needed to do the work. And of course, there's wasted heat, which we're all grateful for in the wintertime. That way we can pump that wasted heat into our car to keep us warm. Not always appreciated in the summertime. I know I had an old car when I was a student that the heating system didn't work properly and it blew heat into the car even during the summer. It wasn't very long that I got rid of that car. It was, couldn't, couldn't handle it. <laughs> so consider this moving piston. If the system were irreversible, the gas would be permitted to expand rapidly through a series of non-equilibrium states. The properties at the initial and final states you could define and the work is calculated using this particular equation, which you have already learned. The work is minus P external times delta V, where the external pressure is a constant throughout the expansion. Now let's visualize the system again. We have a pressure that is higher than external pressure. We have a pin confining it. And then all of a sudden we pull the pin out and we allow that gas to expand until the pressure, the surroundings, and the pressure internally of our system are equal. Now, 
if I had an internal pressure of 200 kilopascals and an external pressure of 100 kilopascals, the gas system is in equilibrium at that point, but with the pin in place. But when I remove the pin, all of a sudden the equilibrium is blown. The gas expands to P2 until P2 equals the pressure of the surroundings. It will then return to another equilibrium. So during the transition from P1 to P2, system was not at equilibrium. Let's look at a PV graph for this irreversible expansion. So this shows you, for instance, the original pressure of the gas, P1. As the gas expanded, of course, the volume was changing. The volume is increasing until P2. This is uh, the external pressure opposing that expansion. And we can calculate the work done by multiplying that external pressure by the change in volume from P1 to P2, there was a change in volume. And the arrow simply denotes we're going from a pressure state one to a pressure state two. This is the axis for pressure, the axis for volume. So since the two pressures are not equal, the system pressure is much greater than the external pressure, you get a rapid expansion. How do we calculate the work done in this instance? Well, we know it's the external pressure times the volume and <clears throat> the work in this case, it's, being, it's work being done by the system as it expands. Work being done by a system is considered to be negative work because the system is losing energy. It's the internal energy of the molecules is changing because it's doing work. And the only way you can keep it at constant temperature is if heat energy flows in to provide <clears throat> the difference. Now, we can calculate the work done by multiplying the P times delta B. If you look at the graph over here, it's the area underneath this curve, uh, not the curve, sorry, but that straight line. So from V1, the volume here, to V2, the volume here, there is the quantity of energy required which that energy is work, work done by the gas as it expanded. Now, what is this area in here? Hmm. Well, must be the measure the inefficiency of the process because the external pressure was so different than the internal pressure. There was some wasted energy there when the gas expanded. So there was a lot of extra work being done that didn't get transformed into the movement of that piston. So what does the area between the red line and represent and the blue line represent? It represents wasted heat energy. So how can we calculate that? That's what we're gonna talk about next, okay? If it's a reversible gas process, when the gas expands, the work can be calculated by approximating a process of very, very small changes in volume, infinitely small amounts if you may, which we're gonna call DV, small incremental changes in volume. And the external pressure will be held constant, but the external pressure is gonna equal the pressure of the gas. So when we uh, perform our first incremental change, it's gonna be a small change in volume, and then we're gonna keep performing those same incremental steps, a very, very small increase in volume until we reach the end. You've learned in mathematics, of course, that we can calculate the areas of these tiny little rectangles. We can do that using calculus. We're going to always set it so the external pressure is equal to the system pressure inside that gas as it expands. So from V1 to V2, there was a change, an infinite number of changes. So the change in volume of the system from V1 to V2 can be represented by those incremental changes, dVs. So we can use calculus now to develop a formula that we can use to calculate the work done. <clears throat> and we can say the integral from V1 to V2 times the 
pressure external times dv, those incremental changes, where p external equals p. If p external equals p, we can simply substitute. And we can say the work is minus the integral from v1 to v2 of p dv. Now remember, pv really equals nRT. So pressure can be equal to nRT divided by v. So I've substituted for pressure. I've substituted nRT divided by v. And of course, since n, r, and t are all constants, n being the number of moles of gas, r the gas law constant, t is temperature, it's an isothermal process, remember, we can take those out. And now we're gonna be equal to minus nRT from V1 to V2 of one over V. Well, you should recognize that one over V is a very common mathematical relationship. And of course, we know that to be natural logarithm. So we can calculate the work is minus nRT, the ln multiplied by the ln of V2 minus the ln natural logarithm of V1 or ln. Now remember the rule in mathematics, the ln of A minus the ln of B equals the ln of A divided by B. So we can change the equation to look like this where the work is minus nRT, the bond of V2 divided by V1 for any isothermal reversible process. Very convenient formula using calculus. And we know the work in equals the heat out or the work out equals the heat in. We know delta U is always gonna be zero because in an isothermal process, again, the molecules remain moving at the same rates. There's no temperature change. Temperature is a measure of how fast those molecules are moving on average. It's not changing. And since temperature and number of moles are constant, we can also use the combined gas law equation, which is V1 P1 over T1 equals V2 P2 over T2. All I've done is gotten rid of the Ts since they're constant, gotten rid of the Ns from VP equals NRT. So the ends are no longer there because they're constant. The quantity of gas isn't going to change throughout these, this process. And we can also take this equation and divide both sides by V1. If we divide the left by V1, right by V1, and we're going to divide the left by P2 and the right by P2, we also have this equation. Okay. So in addition to using the volumes, if you're given a question where we don't know the volumes and you're given pressures instead, we can also use this equation. So the work done is equal to minus nRT ln P2, P1 over P2, or V1 over V2, dependent again on the information given in the problem. This is for isothermal processes. Now, does this really make sense? Let's think about this for a second. When you have a given amount of an ideal gas and it expands at a constant temperature, the internal energy of the gas remains constant. So delta U must equal zero. And this condition means, again, that the work and the heat are equal and opposite. So if a gas expands, heat energy <clears throat> is required to expand the gas, and they're going to be equal and opposite. Thus, the quantity of energy Q is always equal to W. The gas expands and work is performed. Now, where does the energy come from? It comes from the surroundings. The surroundings furnish the energy through heat flow necessary to perform the work. And the surroundings are generally so large that their temperature is unaffected. So for any irreversible uh, <clears throat> isothermal process, you can use these equations, which we have just derived. And remember, delta U, if it's isothermal and the temperature is zero, delta U will be zero. We know enthalpy change, which is, a <clears throat> remember, a defined state function. It's based on uh, calculations performed on heat whenever the pressure is kelp constant. We know delta H is equal to changes in internal energy plus the changes in pressure volume, and we can also calculate delta H 
again, using NCP delta T, because if the pressure is constant, we can calculate the amount of heat, which we call enthalpy. And remember, if it's isothermal, the delta T is zero. So if delta T is zero, this equals zero as enthalpy change also equals zero. So for an isothermal reversible process, delta U will always be zero, delta H will always be zero. So let's try a problem now, all right? So in this problem, it says calculate delta U, delta H, Q and W associated with a process in which five moles of a gas expands reversibly at a constant temperature of 298 Kelvin from a pressure of 110 kilopascals to a pressure of 101 kilopascals. So there's a drastic change in pressure there. Let's and look at the problem and look for keywords. What are some of the keywords? Well, expands reversibly at a constant temperature. Pretty important words to uh, recognize when you're solving this problem, okay? Now, I'd like you to pause the presentation right now and solve the problem on your own because watching me solve problems really doesn't teach you a whole lot. The learning process really occurs when you sit down and struggle on your own to solve the questions. So I'll ask please that you pause the presentation at this point, solve the question, compare the answers to the answers that you're going to see arriving next. Hello, welcome back. Now we're gonna perform the calculation on this question. We're gonna pick out the uh, pieces of information that are really important to us. In fact, it's isothermal, constant temperature, 298 Kelvin. And <clears throat> that's important. There's no mention of a chemical reaction going on. So we don't have to worry about Hess's law, which we use to calculate enthalpy changes during chemical reactions. We know that the gas is expanding, so we're gonna show the volume increasing. We're gonna show the pressure slowly decreasing because the gas is expanding. It's using energy to expand. So the pressure is gonna go down. Always a good idea to sketch out a diagram of what the system is doing, so you understand what is happening. Now we know from the previous explanation, internal energy is not changing, why not? Because there's no temperature change. Internal energy depends on temperature change. And if there is no change in energy, molecules don't move faster or slower, they're going at the same rate, their internal energy is unchanged. Delta H, is also unchanged. And again, when we calculate delta H, we use CP, because if we use CV, some of the energy is going into a volume change. At, when the system is at constant pressure, we know all the energy, <clears throat> or sorry, at a constant volume, we know all the energy is going into the molecules of gas. So internal energy changes at a constant volume, whereas enthalpy changes are always calculated at constant pressure. Now the work, we're given two pressures. So instead of using the other equation that has volumes in it, we're gonna use the equation that uses pressures. And all that's left to do is to calculate the answer. So the work is minus five zero zero moles. A little word here about when you're solving questions on a exam, quiz, midterm, always use the correct number of significant digits. Don't just put a five here. Put three significant digits and the temperature here, well, is three significant digits. Okay. So we're going to use R. We know temperature is 298 Kelvin. Again, three significant digits. We're going to use uh, R to three significant digits. And we're putting in the pressure. Now we want to change the energy to kilojoules from joules because it's gonna be a large number. And we're gonna multiply by the ln of P1 divided by P2. Most common area where students would make a mistake, they put the pressures in the wrong places. And hopefully you can catch yourself by looking at the answer and seeing if it makes sense. When we calculate the answer now, 
We're going to multiply this out. And this was the energy change in kilojoules. Notice it's got three significant digits because the quantities in the question were three significant digits. And we performed all multiplications here and divisions. <laughs> and that was for five moles of gas. And we know the Q, the heat, is equal and opposite to the work. So if the work done was minus 28.5 kilojoules, which is work done by the system, the amount of heat that flowed in had to be equal and opposite. So heat flowed into the gas to replace the energy that was utilized in that expansion. Now, again, if you think about it, it makes sense, hopefully. When gases expand, they do work. Why do we consider it to be negative? The work done by the expanding gas is done on the surroundings. It's because the gas, as it is expanding, is doing work. It's losing some of its energy to do that work. And that's why we arbitrarily just call that negative work. So expanding gases are always doing negative work. And the heat flowed into the surroundings, <clears throat> in from the surroundings to the system. So that was positive heat flow. Because the amount of energy, again, went up when the heat flowed into those molecules. After they expanded, did work, heat flowed in to take its place. Please do the homework that is assigned for every single lecture. And every lecture will show you homework. Well, in this case, the homework is in the course pack on page 34. It's also in the lecture notes for those of you who haven't uh, been able to get a copy of the course pack because of the uh, closing of PNCC. I recognize that's a bit of a problem, but the lecture notes are there. The only difference is the lecture notes are printed out lecture by lecture. So, and if you don't have a printer, going to be a bit of a problem, I would recommend that you just do the work, pause, and, and as you're watching my lectures, pause and fill in the necessary notes and solutions to problems in those spaces. That's how this course was designed. It's not just designed so you can just sit here and watch the lectures and learn. No, it's a participation uh, activity. You need to do the work as you're watching my lectures. So. When I look at YouTube and look at the um, dynamics of the YouTube, uh, how people are using it, I'm gonna see that if you're pausing it or not, okay? Now here are the answers to those questions that are in the course pack. Do the questions first, all right? It's really important that you do the questions before you go and look into Appendix B of OnQ, because all the solutions are there. Not just the answers, but solutions. And that's how you're going to learn incrementally as we go through. We start slowly. Gradually, it's going to become a little bit more difficult. We're in week two right now. And our first quiz will be week four. So week four's quiz will be on all the thermodynamics problems that you will be assigned. <clears throat> and the examples that you've, been see, you've seen done, any of those questions, types of questions are fair game. All right. And for you to just look up the answers and look at the solutions is really counterproductive. You got to do it yourself. I know you're really busy, but you have to get into a routine. If you want to be successful in this course, you've got to do all the questions on your own. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.